never. <laughs> if anything, I, uh, <laughs> it only went up in my estimation. But it is uh, true, and this is something Virginia writes about a lot, about the, the assumption that a person has to be unbalanced to want to, to perform such an immensely altruistic act. Uh, MatchingDonors.com is in the category of the, uh, the anonymous donor. Uh, although, although, believe me, you, you develop a relationship with these people because, I mean, the person that you may get your, do your kidney from on matching donors, because it takes weeks. This is something I think a lot of folks don't understand. You can't give an organ impulsively. There are weeks to months of medical testing and some psychological testing as well. So that should allay the, the concern of the physician this gentleman was talking about. Um, they do uh, interview you. You have, meet with either a psychiatrist or a social worker. And there is a kind of mental assessment so that anyone who was psychotic or had some you know, truly bizarre motive uh, uh, is questioned and typically screened out. Uh, but I've been also very, very dismayed by some of the objections to MatchingDonors.com because they think you're jumping ahead of the line. But you're not jumping ahead of the line. The line is for cadaver organs. Uh, also, when you get a kidney, everyone behind you moves up. Uh, and, and lastly, someone who gives um, you a kidney often does it when they look at MatchingDonors.com. It, it, be, it becomes a very intimate connection. Uh, they're not randomly handing out their organ. They, de they decide based on the profile. You write a personal profile. They talk to you. And uh, people want to give to someone that means something to them, even if that relationship evolves even on the internet. So people aren't giving kidneys away anonymously to the list very much. So it's not as if you're taking a kidney away from someone who might have otherwise got it who's next on the list. And lastly, you know, people join matchingdonors.com and go to China and do these kinds of things, again, out of desperation, and to scold these patients and to think, uh, you know, um, shake your finger and say matchingdonors.com is unethical is, is a strange thing and a, in a way a heartless thing because we, we do these things because the system itself is inadequate. And uh, we have to save ourselves. In the, and in, meanwhile, we are not hurting anyone else. Virginia Pastrell, well, let me yeah. ask you a quick question. The operation was in March. How much before that did you decide to, that you were going to give your kidney away? Well, as Sally mentioned, it was about a year ago. I forget the exact date. She probably has a record of it, but it was. I do. <laughs> um, and, and what I did was I decided that if I told Sally I would do it, only I, mean, I would do it. Only if there were some medical reason that I couldn't would I back out. So that I didn't want to raise her hopes if, and, and then, you know, crash them. And, and this is, a, uh, because I couldn't, I, it seemed like it would be much better not to volunteer at all. Uh, so that, that was an issue. I just want to say that the, the caller is so right about this notion that giving a kidney means you're insane. Uh, the system is extremely patronizing and disrespectful of living donors and of their motives and of their uh, psychological makeup. And, uh, you know, people who have religious motives are thought to be crazy, uh, you know, and, and which is very odd given all the uh, things that we supposedly have adhere to and as the caller mentioned you know there are soldiers and we admire them and and I would say you know the, there are firefighters and we admire them we depend on them there are people who, uh, people who deal with infectious diseases we admire them and and we depend on them and by the way they all get paid um, we don't think they're crazy but there is this notion that uh, giving up a kidney shows that you're you know a normal person wouldn't do that you're a little unbalanced and then that translates into the idea that anything that encourages you, that might tip you toward donation, is a form of coercion. Uh, whether that's some kind of financial incentive, whether it's, uh, you know, I would like to see churches encourage their members to donate, you know, but, but a lot of people in the transplant community would think that that's some sort of undue coercion uh, just because people are saying, you know, this is another of uh, many, there are many opportunities to help people. This is one of them that suits some people. I, I don't think everybody should be a kidney donor. I don't think there's anything wrong with not being a kidney donor, but I think it's a perfectly 
fine and rational thing to do if, if your life, if your health and your life allow you to do it. Let's go for our last call to Sioux City, uh, Iowa. You're on the air. Yes, I do want to thank you for having this program. I'm the recipient of a liver transplant seven years ago, and uh, I also am now on a donor list. Uh, I was told by my doctors that uh, the liver that I receive could be retransplanted if, if uh, you know, the circumstances were correct. Uh, my wife and family are also on transplant list, and I just uh, thought I would add that to the conversation, and uh, I thank you again for uh, having this program and sharing your information with us. Thanks. We're out of time, but I want to ask Sally to tell a question about uh, how how many times in your life had you talked to Virginia Pastrell before <laughs> she called you and said, I'll give you my kidney? Well, I know. I think I saw her about six times. I met her in 1997 through Jim Glassman and uh, my colleague at AEI. And I think I saw her maybe six or seven times in person then. I always liked her so much and were fond acquaintances, respected her work enormously. Maybe we emailed you know, intermittently, but it, I couldn't say it was a very close relationship. Virginia, it is. Virginia Postrel, um <clears throat> when uh, you agreed to do this and your husband went along with it, um, did you have any time right before the operation where you got scared of this idea and wanted to pull out? No, I didn't, but I did wait until because it was uncertain that it would actually go through, I waited uh, until very close to the operation to tell other family members. And my parents totally freaked out and wanted me to back out at the last minute and, and such, but, uh, you know, that wasn't going to happen. No, I was, you know, it's scary, um, but it's not that scary, I, I guess I would say. Are you, um, are you going to be on drugs the rest of your life? Me? That's me. Yeah. No, no, just, just yeah. Sally Sattel? Yeah. Oh, yes. No, I, my life is completely exactly the way it was before the operation, except for I have a little scar. Well, we've got to wrap it up. Please, let's do some more of this. It's uh, very interesting, and I didn't get about one-tenth of my questions <laughs> answered in the audience. Uh, <laughs> tremendous involvement. But we have Sally Sattel this morning in Denver at the Cable Center, where our C-SPAN studios are, and Virginia Postrel in Los Angeles. Both, neither one of them live there, and they got up very early to do this. <laughs> and we thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you.